March 1945, Iwo Jima. One of the bloodiest battles of the Pacific Campaign. In the midst of the deafening roar of artillery and guns firing, an obscure mystical language is heard crackling across the island. It's a language that became one of America's greatest military secrets, a language spoken by Navajos. How did these Native Americans come to play a pivotal role in the war in the Pacific? Join us as we go in search of history and uncover one of the least known stories of World War II, the story of the Navajo Code Talkers. The Navajo language was said to have been first spoken at the dawn of creation. The first word, there was light. And the second word, there was earth. The third word, there was water. The fourth, there was air. These elements are also language. They are one and the same. By simply speaking these language is how the whole world and the universe came about. They are the words of the Diné, the Navajo. Words present at the creation of the Navajo world. Words that the white man had been trying to destroy for more than a century. Words that, ironically, would prove invaluable during World War II. Navajo is a language descended from a tribe that crossed a land bridge from Asia into Alaska. These ancient nomads spoke a language derived from several Chinese-Tibetan languages that was distinguished by its peculiar phrasing and subtle tones. Well, the Navajo language, we think, is, and it's often classified as an Athabascan language, which means that the Navajos speak a language that is related to languages that are spoken in northwestern Canada and into Alaska. Navajo was, a, was an oral language. It was not a written language. It was not a language that they used other than in oral form. And so, therefore, it gave it, it, it was a bit of a double-edged sword. It gave it a kind of complexity in terms of how it was spoken that in English we, we don't have. We can speak English very sloppily and still be understood, whereas in Navajo, precision is everything. You really need to say it just so or you say something else. The Navajos eventually settled in an area between what they called the Four Sacred Mountains, known today as Arizona, New Mexico, and Southern Utah. They lived peacefully until the 16th century when Spanish invaders swept through the Southwest. There was further persecution in the middle of the 19th century when fortune hunters and frontiersmen from the eastern United States began a systematic repression of the Navajos. Civil War General William Tecumseh Sherman dealt with the Navajo problem by carrying out a policy of eradicating the Native Americans. The more we kill this year, the less we have to kill next year. Their attempts at civilization are simply ridiculous. By 1863, U.S. military forces led by Kit Carson were tracking Navajos across their lands, slaughtering livestock, destroying crops, burning villages, and killing all those that resisted. A year after Carson's campaign began, the Navajo Indians acquiesced. They were driven like cattle 350 miles to Fort Sumner in central New Mexico. Their march into exile has come to be known as the Long Walk. And it was not a walk, it was hundreds of miles and it went under forced march and there, you can imagine women who were pregnant, you can imagine the elderly, you can imagine children, you can imagine people not in good health. All the difficulties that were associated with that very traumatic time. And you, can, you have to remember that the people did not know whether they would be able to ever to return. And they had been brought up to, to, to believe 
that they must live within the boundaries of these sacred mountains. There was uh, a lot of uh, mistreatment, and the Navajo says this will probably never be written in the history books, but they say they know, they know that it happened. After suffering for four years in exile at Fort Sumner, in 1868, Navajo chief Barbon Sito negotiated a treaty with the United States. His people returned to the protection of the four sacred mountains. As part of the treaty, the government assumed responsibility for educating Navajo children. There's a phrase I like to quote from one commissioner of Indian Affairs who said with no sense of irony whatsoever, you know, he said, it's time to make the Indians feel at home in America and the boarding schools were supposed to be part of that process. The children were not only taken from their families, but they were also told to bury their own Navajo culture. Your religion is paganism, your uh, culture is backwards, your language will not get you any place, you know. Uh, learn a trade. In other words, be a white man. Speaking your own tongue was forbidden, totally forbidden. And uh, if you're ever caught taught Navajo, talking to your own language, you got punished for it. Carl Gorman attended Indian schools in the 1920s and passed on stories to his daughter, Zani. At that time, they would get demerits if they got caught speaking Navajo. And he racked up his demerits <laughs> and he was punished. He was um, chained in the basement of the hospital or the church. Um, they. They left him there for three days, fed him bread and water. The Navajo culture uh, kind of taught you to be aware, to be ready for something, for an enemy. While the enemy of the Navajo seemed to be the American white man, on December 7th, 1941, a more ominous enemy revealed itself. I was out on the football field playing with some other boys, throwing football. One of the boys ran over and they said that uh, the Japanese attacked uh, United States. Uh, they bombed Pearl Harbor. Attacking Pearl Harbor really had a lot of effect on us, simply because it was a sneak attack, a sneaky way to do things. The Navajo Nation swiftly reacted to Japan's attack. Nearly 100 young Navajo men headed for the reservation agency to report for duty. After all, it was something they had prepared for their entire lives. Some even brought their own rifles. Being a Native American has a lot to do with uh, protecting your country. That's automatic. You, you, you were told that this is your land, this is, this is, this is what you have here. And uh, you, you protect that. And there were those with deeper, more personal reactions and memories to news of the war's atrocities. When I read about Asia, the Japanese uh, occupation, Eastern Asia, where they were raping uh, children, they were killing women, they were killing practically everybody. And it reminded me of the long walk, you know, and, 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 and I always think, why, why do these things happen? Appropriation of their land, the long walk, unlawful abuses, and the poor treatment in the Bureau of Indian Affairs schools, all were significant reasons why the Navajo Nation would not want to join the war. But still, Navajo men volunteered. Although there is no equivalent to the English word patriotism in the Navajo language, the patriotism of these men was overwhelmingly evident and would soon be put to the test. Winter, 1941. In Europe, Germany was advancing into Russia and Britain was virtually surrounded. From the Japanese perspective, the only obstacle in the way of a worldwide Axis victory was the U.S. Navy's presence in the Pacific Ocean, and Pearl Harbor had just been destroyed. The Japanese literally burst out of their empire and swept over Southeast Asia, attacking uh, strongholds or islands throughout uh, the Pacific. 
not only seizing them to prevent being attacked themselves, but literally trying to cut the lifeline that would, must exist between the United States and Hawaii and New Zealand and Australia. The Allied forces found themselves with a formidable task, to battle the Japanese across hundreds of islands spread over thousands of miles of the Pacific. Coordinating troop movements over this sprawling theater of war without alerting the enemy required swift, secure military communications, the type of communications that the Allies sorely lacked. A general can't send out a message to his troops by radio saying, attack at dawn on the right, because the other side can pick up this message, intercept it, hear what it says, and take countermeasures. So what generals and admirals do is put their messages into some secret form. The Japanese had wonderful cryptographers. Many of them were educated in the United States, spoke perfect English. So they were very quick at breaking the American codes. This put the United States at a severe disadvantage going into World War II. As one war analyst put it, the Japanese were so successful in breaking American codes, military communications were made available to the enemy like sand sifting through a sieve. Clearly, the United States needed to create an unbreakable code, and the country's best military minds set out to solve the problem. But it was a civilian who came up with an intriguing proposal. Philip Johnston, a civil engineer living in Los Angeles, was familiar with the Navajo language. It is a very complex and sophisticated language, and so therefore if you don't learn it as a very young person or as a child, as the Navajo children did, it is very unlikely that you're ever going to be able to understand the language. Two months after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, Johnston presented his idea of using the Navajo language to create an unbreakable military code. What exactly happened is, is uh, questionable. Um, there is the story that Philip Johnston, who was the son of a white missionary who grew up on the reservation, um, was the one that brought the idea to the Marine Corps. The extent of Johnston's involvement may never be fully known, but one thing is certain. The Navajo isolation kept their culture and their language almost completely unknown. And at the time, in 1942, there were less than 40 non-Navajo that understood the Navajo language. Certainly, the, the Japanese were not going to be uh, amongst that group. But the Marines had to be convinced the language could be used in battle. So Philip Johnston and a group of Navajo volunteers set up a demonstration. And the top brass gave these men six kinds of messages that would normally be sent in, in the Pacific and asked them to put them into Navajo. The Navajo volunteers were able to encode, transmit, and decode any three lines of English in 20 seconds, easily beating a cryptograph machine that took 30 minutes to deliver the same message. It worked beyond their wildest imagination. A special coding unit, the 382nd platoon of the U.S. Marines, was established, and in April 1942, Marine recruiters were dispatched to the Navajo reservation to find the first recruits. There was uh, some Marines, colonels and sergeants, white guys mostly, came out to Fort Defiance. And they told us that they was looking for young Navajos, particularly the one that finished high school. So that's how we got involved. Many of the Navajo recruits lied about their age to enlist. Some were as young as 15 years old, and one volunteer, Carl Gorman, was 35 years old when he enlisted beyond military age. By May 1942, Marine recruiters had interviewed hundreds of potential Navajo candidates for the new Marine coding unit. Only 30 Navajo were selected, meeting the requirements that they were fluent in both Navajo and English. These men were sent to the Marine boot camp at San Diego for their special training. When I was in that training, uh, one of the officers came by. Hey, chief, he says, uh, are you an Indian? No, I'm a Navajo. Oh, good, he says. Do you speak Navajo? Yes, sir. Do you understand Navajo? Yes, sir. Good. Yeah, well, we have a place for you. So they took me to this uh, barracks. 
And I went there and and uh, we unloaded and, and I saw all these young Navajos all in their dungarees and carrying books, you know, and uh, they were in this Navajo code school. After San Diego, the Navajos went to the Field Signal Battalion at Camp Pendleton, California. Only one recruit washed out, leaving 29. Carl Gorman was among those Navajo code talkers, known as the first 29. Gorman died in January 1998. His daughter, Zani, has documented the code's origin. Once the first 29 came in and they went through boot camp and they were told specifically what they were there for, they were given full reign to develop this code. A G. A G. After a crash course in military coding systems, the Navajos created 411 terms that could be used in combat. Most of the code was actually developed by the Navajo themselves, using mainly the Navajo language as it existed and then improvising as necessary for unique military terms, amphibious tractor, tank, uh, attack airplane, ship, words that were not common into the Navajo language. They either invented words, and the Navajo language is very beautiful and very complex and adaptable, so they could invent words that would be easily understood by the code talkers. So if you know they say something about bird, you know it's an airplane. They say something about fish, you know it's something about some kind of a ship. Or if they name something on the ground, you know it's something on the ground. It's like a dive bomber. They call it again. It's like uh, the word uh, attack. Attachete means uh, coming in in the morning during the, the final day of the squad dance. In, 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 in battle, it means attack. The Marine Corps specifically asked them to code the English alphabet. And the way in which they did that is what they call a double code. You take the letter A, for example, and what they decided to do was to choose a word in English that started with that particular letter. And then they would translate that into Navajo. So A was ant, and in Navajo it's wulachi. B, bear, shush. C, cat, musi. So you had to understand the Navajo word and then translate that into English and then take the first letter of the word in English to know what it was, what letter it was. So um, it, it, was, it was almost foolproof. It was foolproof. In addition to being obscure and almost impossible to understand by outsiders, the Navajo language was perfect for coding because it was not a written language. It had to be memorized as the code itself was memorized, a task that proved to be very simple for the code talkers. They could speak it rapidly, they could, and they could speak it imaginatively, and they could use it for all these kinds of purposes in a way that, that satisfied military requirements for, for speed and expediency. We're looking at the code book that we developed when we formed 5th Marine Division to teach other Navajos, 33 of them. Over here is military meaning, like uh, Africa, Jini, Navajo, Blackies, Philippines, we call it Kayahna El. That means floating land. Bombs, we call it a Yanji, that means eggs. Potato means hand grenades. I knew that it was a weapon in a way. It, a Navajo language, you know, and, uh, because we had to learn this code and uh, it was used, you know. So it, in essence, it is, it is a weapon. 1942, Japanese forces were rapidly advancing throughout the Pacific. Allied commanders knew that if the Japanese gained control of the entire Pacific area, they might never be dislodged. Military action was stepped up. The stakes were very great because uh, hundreds of men were dying every day and uh, we had to advance as much as we possibly could. By October, 29 Navajo Marines had used their language to create a code that would completely baffle Japanese cryptographers. The code was ready for battle. Now these Marines would prepare themselves with the same sacred ceremony and prayers that had protected their ancestors when they went into battle. 
the four sacred mountains that surround the Navajo country, this is home to us. When we go outside the four sacred mountains, we are in alien territory. There seems to be no clearly defined supreme being in Navajo thought. However, there are ceremonial rituals to encourage the Ye, or holy ones, to assist with supernatural powers. You were scared, but and I, I asked the holy people to protect me from any harm from the enemy. The essence of the Navajo way is a belief in harmony, a belief in keeping balance. It is often referred to as, as blessing way. Um, it is a belief in keeping in balance within yourself, within, without, with everything around you. When Navajo people pray, we use um, tadatin or, or corn pollen. You offer it to the Mother Earth, you offer it to Father Sky, an offering to, to the elements um, to keep in balance, to keep in harmony. Um, to ask for whatever it is you're asking for. I have the pollen corn, a pollen little bag I have in my, my billfold, in a, in a piece of paper that I carry to protect me. Two Navajo code talkers remained in San Diego to train new recruits, while the remaining 27 were shipped out to the Pacific. At Guadalcanal, the Navajo code talkers were put to the test for the first time, not as code talkers, but as Marines in battle. In the spring of 1942, as the red Japanese tide rolled over Southeast Asia, took uh, a storm into uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, rolled down the Solomons and threatened to sever the lifeline from Hawaii to the Australians, America was not prepared, but nevertheless was forced into the operation which we know now as the attack on Guadalcanal. You're actually in a battle, so to speak. The people shooting at you, dropping bombs or artillery fires, whatever. And you think to yourself, hey, am I going to make it? This is real war. Of course, I had to use Navajo language, you know, and uh, that, was, uh, that was something uh, kind of a special to me. The Navajos were prepared. They were ready to deploy their secret weapon, their code. But it seemed the military wasn't ready to use it. For several months, head, headquarters Marine Corps in Washington had many other things to worry about, raising a Marine Corps, get, going to war, and not a very good understanding of either the Navajo people, their value as Marines, or the idea of using this seemingly crazy idea of using Navajo language as a code. Well, the commanders, uh... Most of them did not really realize what it was. They didn't, I don't think they even knew there was such a thing as Navajo code talkers. Uh, my commander was totally uh, ignorant of it. The battalion commander that I was with. Some commanders were so uncertain about the purpose of code talkers, they simply used the Navajos as runners to carry messages from one place to another. But as the Marines became further mired in the jungles of Guadalcanal, the most efficient means of passing orders and reporting enemy positions was via radio communication. The code talkers would finally demonstrate their system worked. The credit, I think, really needs to go to the um, United States Marine Raiders, uh, Carlson's uh, Raiders. They specifically asked for Navajo code talkers to come into their units. They were saying, you know, this works, this is great, uh, it's accurate, it's fast, um, please send us some more code talkers. Clearly, it had a dramatic reduction in Marine casualties because right on the spot, Marines could quickly and reliably call the code talker to the tactical radio set, ask for close air support, ask for naval gunfire, ask for an emergency resupply of ammunition, and at the other end, without any question as to the auth authenticity of the transmission, that it was coming from American Marines. After the success of the Guadalcanal experiment, 83 more code talkers were sent to the Pacific. A year after Guadalcanal, there were nearly 150 code talkers stationed in the Pacific. In campaigns on Bougainville, Tarawa, Tinian, and Guam, the code talkers directed gunfire from Allied ships and airplanes toward pockets of Japanese strongholds. 
After successes on Roy Namur and Anuitak, Saipan needed to be secured. In one remarkable incident during the battle, a flank of Marines found themselves deep within enemy territory and were mistakenly shelled by their own artillery units. The trapped Marines radioed for the bombardment to stop, but since the Japanese often faked radio transmissions, the shelling continued. Finally, the Marine command post radioed back, do you have a Navajo there? A Navajo code talker in the advanced unit rushed to the radio and spoke the code. I need to send this message! What, sir? I need to send this message! No one but a Navajo member of the U.S. Marine Corps could have made that call, and the bombardment stopped immediately. So, these words have power. Words, language, both have blessing and protection. As time went on, the Japanese became desperate to break the seemingly unintelligible code. Our code was never broken by anyone, even by Navajo. I had some friends that were captured on the Philippines. They were in prison over in Japan. One of them was Joe Kiyoni. An unfortunate Navajo POW who was not a code talker, Kiyomi, was forced to try and translate the jumbled gibberish of the code talkers. They used to have him stand out in the football field naked and his feet will froze to the ground and then falls and then his skin will be still there and they drag him and they keep him alive. He said he tried to break the code. He write all kinds of stuff, it didn't mean anything. Since Kiyomi did not know the code within his coded language, it sounded like nonsense to him. As the U.S. forces island hopped closer and closer to the Japanese mainland, more and more commanding officers in the field began to have faith in the Code Talker's abilities. The Code Talker program grew until eventually 350 to 400 Navajos were involved. A typical uh, Marine division in combat uh, would have at least uh, six or more radio teams forward with their fighting uh, battalions, as well as Navajo that were back at the larger command post, allowing the communications to be coded in Navajo language at one end and decoded rapidly as almost as quickly as we are talking now, as opposed to having people work through machines or code tables. And Iwo Jima was really the culmination of, of this whole evolutionary process, because by the time they fought Iwo Jima, the code had gone through several revisions. They were literally a walking, talking secret weapon because all the code was in their head. The Navajo weapon was a good weapon for the military because it protected our secrets. In a certain sense, in a linguistic sense, it's like the armor on a tank. It's like uh, a helmet on your head because it protects. It, what it protects was intellectual material, intelligence information, but it protected against the enemy knowing what you're doing and taking action against it. So in, to this degree, it was an excellent weapon. In the 5,000-year history of Japan, no foreign army had ever trod on its soil until the Allies landed at Iwo Jima. This tiny volcanic island is 650 miles from Tokyo. 22,000 Japanese soldiers were ordered to fight to their deaths to defend it. Iwo Jima was also crucial to the Allies. Sitting right in the middle of a bombing route between the Mariana Islands and Tokyo, the Japanese could spot Allied B-29s and take off from Iwo Jima to intercept them. The U.S. forces had to control the island. In February 1945, a massive attack force arrived. 880 ships carrying 110,000 Marines including the Navajo code talkers. All of a sudden, you know, I, I start thinking, I could see all these young Marines with all their helmets, compact gear, and their necks were red, and it was real quiet, you know, on the boat. And I was thinking, I wonder if they're uh, trained. I wonder if they're well trained just to be safe. And then I thought, gee, how about me? You know, I wonder if I got enough training. 
When you start thinking that, you want to shake it off. You want to shake it off, you know, and try to do something or talk to somebody, you know. And you don't want to keep thinking that. You, you want to, you still want to be the few, the brave, and the Marine. Once ashore, the Marines were hampered by the loose volcanic ash. Unable to dig foxholes, they were easy targets for hidden Japanese gunners. But when we hit the beach, I got numb from my leg, but I kept going. And when you walk, you feel like you're standing in one place. It's the ash. And I think I aged about a year right there, one spot. You wake up in the morning before dawn, that's when you really, that's when you pray the Navajo way, old traditional way. Uh, you, you ask the sun and the earth that you be spared from any bad things that's going might happen to you. There were no front lines on Iwo Jima. The Marines fought above ground, but the Japanese were entrenched below ground. They had dug 1,500 rooms in the rocky island and connected them with 16 miles of tunnels. While the Marines rarely saw a Japanese soldier at its post, the Japanese could see the Marines perfectly. That was uh, one of the most uh, scariest uh, battle campaigns that I had ever been in. There, you never saw an enemy. I didn't anyway. You see them shooting from uh, bunkers, pillboxes. They had every ground covered. Every inch of the ground that they that they, they uh, that was covered from a hill. The Japanese believed that if America's casualties were high enough on Iwo Jima, the Allies would think twice about launching an invasion against the Japanese mainland. So the Japanese strategy was simple no Japanese survivors. Each soldier was ordered to kill at least 10 Americans. As ground was won by the Allies, then lost and won again, each soldier must have performed his own personal ritual of protection. For the code talkers, they placed corn pollen on their tongues as a blessing so they might better perform their job and speak the code more clearly. Yes, our mission was to communicate top secret messages. We didn't send any messages about Sunday school programs. Or we left that to the Anglos. <laughs> and and uh, whatever we sent was, they were brief, brief messages. And they were always top secret. For 36 days, more than 100,000 men relentlessly fought each other on a tiny island the size of Manhattan. Historians described U.S. forces' massive attack against the Japanese defense as throwing human flesh against reinforced concrete. Mostly the uh, white boys, you know, I've seen a lot of them got shot. There was, there was four of us Navajos. We were lucky that, you know, we always, you know, we always miss us or something. Code two. For a record 48 hours, six code talkers worked around the clock sending and receiving 800 messages on Iwo Jima, all without a single error. And it's very difficult to say what one single thing, if there could have been a single thing that won a battle. But I would say absolutely that uh, the Marines had something that the Japanese did not have themselves and could, could not deny to us, which was rapid, reliable, absolutely picture-perfect communications of the most sensitive nature in the heat of battle. The highest point on Iwo Jima was Mount Suribachi, an extinct volcano ringed with Japanese reinforcements. It took the Marines a week to ascend the 550-foot mountain. And on February 23, 1945, a code talker transmitted the most exhilarating message of the battle. <laughs> Hidden within the mysterious code of the Navajos was the string of words sheep, uncle, ram, ice, bear, ant, cat, 
horse, itch. It spelled out Suribachi. Later, 5th Marine Division Signal Officer Major Howard Connor would summarize the contributions made by the Code Talkers, saying that without the Navajos, the Marines never would have taken Iwo Jima. Six months after the flag was raised over Iwo Jima, a Navajo radio operator on the Allied-held island of Okinawa was among the first to receive word that a pair of atomic bombs had fallen on Japan. Suddenly the war was over. So instead of sleeping, we all celebrated. The feeling was good, it was really good. The only thing wrong with it, we were, we were not in the United States, we were overseas. By the end of World War II, 3,600 Navajos had served their country in various branches of the service. While there is no official number, it is believed that up to 400 of those soldiers were code talkers. For those who survived, all that remained was to return to the comfort of the four sacred mountains and deal with the horrific memories of war. I think I find that um, war experiences so dirty and so humbling, unimaginable, dirty, that, uh, that you know, you don't forget these things. When the code talkers were discharged from the service, it was without ceremony or recognition. Just a strict warning to keep the Navajo code a secret, since it might be needed again someday. When we got back to San Diego, we saw all these young kids. The band was marching, and they were all sergeant majors. The young kids, band. They specialize in music, I guess, and you look at them and, God, here we have one stripe, you know. We didn't get no promotion of anything, no silver star, no bronze star, no, no nothing. It, it was just one of those things, I guess. Uh. There's no excuses, there's only explanations. In the context of the times in the 1940s, when the American military itself had not been uh, desegregated, uh, even though France had put American blacks into combat in World War I, we were still, as late as Iwo Jima, just bringing minorities into the fore. But even with the offenses and hardships the Navajos faced after returning home, they had gained a special kind of pride in battling as warriors with a most unconventional weapon. We think we made an important role to help win the war. Our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren will remember us in what they read about us maybe 100 years from now, so it'll be something very useful in history. In 1969, information about the code was finally made public. One year later, code talkers came together to form the Navajo Code Talkers Association. The men who created history's only unbroken battlefield code could now be publicly recognized. Everywhere I speak to Navajo school kids or college kids, I always emphasize, learn your language, your culture. And I think that uh, those people that say English only don't realize the history of Native Americans, what they have gone through, what they have suffered. Several years ago, I took my young sons to a parade here in Gallup, and there was a pickup truck next to us, and a couple of young teenage boys. Uh, one of them was a Navajo, and one of them was Hispanic. They were kind of joking and laughing and, you know, saying things, comments about things that were in the parade and just, just being kids. And the uh, young Navajo kid saw the Code Talkers coming, and his demeanor changed. He took off his baseball cap, and he put it over his heart, and he stood there, very quiet. And the other kid started to say this joke. And the young Navajo kid whipped around and he looked at him and he says, don't say anything about these guys. He says, these guys are special. The Code Talkers Association has a symbol. Designed by artist and code talker Carl Gorman, it was inspired by a Navajo legend about two heroic twins who fought monsters that were plaguing the Diné, the Navajo people. The symbol itself represents a communicator, a, a communication device that 
the holy people used or the, or the hero twins used to communicate with each other. Um, and my dad felt that it was very appropriate that as the hero twins in the story went to fight the monsters that were plaguing the people, using this communication device where they could talk to one another and no one else hear them, that that would be a very appropriate symbol for what the Code Talkers did in World War II, speaking in a language that only they, in a code that they could only understand. <laughs> So they sent two young boys to the sun, to the sun over there, to seek for a weapon that will kill all the monster. The sun gave them a thunderbolt. They said, take this bag down to the earth and use it to kill all the monsters that's trying to get rid of you. Whatever they did, however they used our sacred Navajo the language, I honored them. It was a secret weapon, a code, that came from an unexpected source. And while the story of the Navajo code talkers was suppressed for nearly 25 years, today it is clear that these men were a key factor in the Allied victory in the Pacific during World War II. These are contributions that can only be recognized when we go in search of history.